Yesterday, December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. The United States was at peace with that nation, and at the solicitation of Japan, was still in conversation with its government and its emperor, looking toward the maintenance of peace in the Pacific. Indeed, one hour after Japanese air squadrons had commenced bombing in the American island of Oahu, the Japanese ambassador to the United States and his colleague delivered to our Secretary of State a formal reply to a recent American message. Japan has therefore undertaken a surprise offensive extending throughout the Pacific area. The facts of yesterday and today speak for themselves. No matter how long it may take us to overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people in their righteous might will win through to absolute victory. With confidence in our armed forces, with the unbounding determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph, so help us God. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this evening's edition of Valley Veterans Forum. Tonight, we're going to be introducing Pearl Harbor survivors. They're a rare breed, and very few are left. One of my guests tonight, Patty Waldron, is the daughter of a Pearl Harbor survivor. I thank you for inviting me. And uh, she's going to be telling her dad's story on his behalf. But before we get started, we'll visit another Valley resident, Joe Kiersia, and listen to his story of survival from Pearl Harbor's attack. Joe, it's great to have you on the show. Can you tell us a, a bit about uh, your Navy experience and uh, how, how did it all start? Just got out of high school? Well, yeah, I just got, I got out of high school in June of 1940. And I decided to go to the Navy, but it was, when I went down there, they wanted six years, so I didn't join. I just, well, I'll find a job. But later on in the summer, after working at different little jobs, I never could find nothing steady. So I decided just about the end of the year, join the Navy and, and there was no war yet. This was 40. The war had never started. And uh, I was waited on a buddy of mine that got hurt playing football until his cast came off his leg. And him and I both went up to San Francisco. He had gone through the test and we were accepted. So we were up there waiting on the amount of sailors that was gonna make first company. They have to have, I don't know, I think it was 150 men. When I got at San Francisco, uh, Oakland, I had my shaving gear and all that. I put it in where I was gonna sleep because I had a sleeper. 
We went out to Oakland. By that time we got back, it was gone. Somebody had taken it. So when we got to San Diego, I had to use my $20 that Uncle Sam gave us to enjoy ourselves, to buy new shaving gear. And uh, that was my first experience to start out in the Navy that I didn't have hardly any money to have a good time with. But anyway, I enjoyed the Navy. Well, boot camp was tough. Uh, you know, you, you couldn't do a lot of things. We had two chief petty officers who were in charge and uh, you had to salute them and you had to pay attention to what you were doing, whatever you were doing. And they watch you. If you, you were standing, you couldn't put your hand on a man's shoulder. You had to stand on your own. They'd penalize you, give you extra duty, go around picking up cigarette butts or whatever if you'd done anything that wasn't normal. And I thought, my God, they're sure strict. And then when you put them away, you had to put them away and you had to put a square knot on all the ties so your clothes would fit in your sea bag. So we were having noodles that night and I says, geez, this guy's kind of tight. I asked the guy to give me some more. So he did. And when we got to the table, we sat down, I told Louis, I says, something on this table smells bad, it's rotted. And he says, no, there's nothing rotted. I says, well, it sure smells that way. And it was uh, the cabbage that they had made. Uh, it was, uh, what would you call it? Uh, sauerkraut. sauerkraut. And I thought, God, gee, this stuff is rotted. He says, no, that's good. I, I couldn't eat it. Anyway, that was my first experience with having sauerkraut in my life, which I never tasted in my life. And uh, I wouldn't eat, eat it. sauerkraut to this day? But I eat it now because I learned to like it. It was pretty good after I, what it was. I thought it was rotted, but it wasn't. We had to learn to march, and we had to learn the, the signals by the flag. And uh, then they took us out and showed us how to operate a certain kind of a gun. This they told me later on when I was in the Navy that I had experienced that I had been taught how to, and I forgot all about the gun. I didn't know nothing about it anymore, but that was one of the things they, they put you through and right away you're an experienced gun. I didn't know nothing about guns, but anyway. What was your first assignment? My first, first assignment was a topside sailor. I was on the Medusa. I was assigned to the Ogallala, which is at sea that particular time when we came in. Well, we were on a tanker. They shipped us from uh, Long Beach to uh, Honolulu on the Tippecanoe, which was uh, a tanker. And when we got there, they put so many on different ships, and I was put on the Medusa waiting for the Ogallala. But they finally assigned me to the Medusa, and I stayed on her for almost three years until the war started. I was just a seaman when I went on there and uh, got discharged off of the Medusa to come home for new construction in 43. This is from 1941 to 43. A fireman's, I was a second class petty officer, a water tender, but I started in the repair force with the Medusa. That's where they put me at first. And I didn't like that because I was a little guy. They used to put me in the fire room and these ships would come alongside and repair in the boilers. And that was a tough job. So I just happened to be as a water tender and that's where I start firing boilers. So what does a water tender do? Well, a fire tender, he fires boilers, makes steam. And uh, they take care of uh, the water. We made the, the our department took care of making evaporators where we made water to drink and water for our boilers. We took care of the fire and bilge, which was the pressure. If you had a fire aboard ship, you didn't use fresh water, you used salt water. That was our department. We took on oil. That was our job. But the main thing, was making steam and everything run by steam. Uh, it was a good job. It, and and if I tell you, the Medusa, it was the best feeder because we worked 24 hours a day. There was a force every day working and, and there was always the galley going. You could always get something to eat. And 
what type of ship was the Medusa? Yeah, it was a repair one, AR-1. Uh, it was the only ship in the Navy that could rebore a 16-inch gun. That's what I was told. I never saw one being rebored, but they had a machine shop in there. It looked like it was a block long and uh, all kind of machinery in there. Great ship, great ship. There was, I think, four tenders in the harbor that morning of December the 7th, but we were AR-1. And that morning of December the 7th, the Utah was sunk. So I don't know, as my time of being alive was to be that way that the Medusa wasn't in its birth and the Utah was, and the Utah got sunk. Uh, that's just being fortunate to be transferred or moved out to the stream of the water. We were just a few hundred feet away from the Utah when she went down, and uh, we, we didn't. We we weren't a man of war. We had uh, some 50 calibers in one 1.1 1 .1, uh, anti-aircraft gun on it. We had four five-inch guns. They didn't even have fire pins in them because. It wasn't a, a ship to get out there. And so take us back to that, that day, that infamous day, Pearl Harbor. Uh -huh. Where were you? Where well, were you? We, we, there was about 800 uh, sailors on there. Not hardly any of them had any uh, battle stations because we only had the one 1.1 1 .1 gun and then some 50 calibers. And, Maybe we had some bolts and nuts we could throw at them, and that's just about all we had. I, I had breakfast that morning, and this buddy of mine, Louis Gatewood, that's dead now, was laying in his bunk, and I was in the next bunk looking at him, looking out the porthole, and I told Louis, I says, yeah, they must be having gunnery practice on Fort Island. I says, even the airplanes got red spots on them. And the morning that I got done saying that, GQ sounded. And then they told us this was war, that the Japanese had invaded us. That was what it was. I watched uh, the Curtis get kamikaze, the first uh, Japanese uh, ship that crashed onto the, the Curtis for being a ship that didn't have many guns. We, we had a little piece of it anyway. Uh, it made me proud that we, uh, and we survived. We didn't get hit or nothing. Everybody. Things, every ship that was in harbor should have been hit, but there was 92 pieces of equipment in Pearl that morning, and uh, 26 of them were hit. And watching uh, the Arizona blow up, uh, seeing the smoke, I thought they got the oil tankers when I saw all that smoke. And after that, I got to come home, you know. But uh, that was another proud feeling to have it end and knowing that we were gonna get to come home without being shot at anymore. And uh, it's a good feeling. The Navy was a great place to go, but there was times when you was at sea and, and the ocean was rough and you were down traveling and the squales were 40 feet high and your ship is small and you think you're gonna capsize out there. It, it scares you. Absolutely. But uh, I survived and I came home. Chief, thank you for your service. Thanks, Joe. You're welcome, son. Thank you. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to our program about Valley Veterans Forum and Pearl Harbor survivors. Tonight's guest is Patty Waldron, the daughter of a Pearl Harbor survivor, and she is here to tell us his story. Thank welcome, you for Patty. Thank you for having me. My dad was born in 1919, and he's from a teeny tiny town in West Virginia, back in the hills. No, um, nothing really to offer anybody. And when he had the ability to leave and join the Navy, he joined in 1938. His first duty station was Pearl Harbor, and he was attached first to the Richmond, and then he got transferred soon after that to the Litchfield, which was a destroyer. So they were out to sea, and I remember him telling me many times that they knew the war was eventually gonna start, 
and he had asked, as he told me, several times for a transfer to the Naval Air Corps because in his words, he didn't want to be a sitting duck. So finally the transfer came through. The Pacific Fleet had gone in to Pearl for provisions and everything that they do, refueling, two or three days before December 7th. I know on December 6th, the Litchfield and the fleet were back out to sea. He was dropped off at the sub base because he was attached to the submarine corps. So that morning, he said he woke up and all hell was breaking loose, and he ran downstairs, and at the door, um, they were passing out um, rifles, of which I can't remember right now what it is. I think it was the Springfield. The Springfield, yeah. yeah. Um, According to his story. Right, Springfield. 30 out 6 that was yes. it. Springfield rifle. He said he went out, out the door and looked all around to see my gosh, where can I go? Nobody knew anything other than they were being attacked. There was nobody there to direct them, nobody to tell them what to do. So the barracks is here and the, the dock is here where the submarines are. So he ran out, he saw an old steam shovel at the very end of the submarine dock. So he ran down there and he climbed up inside the big steel bucket of the, um, yeah the dipper of the steam shovel, and he said that was the safest place he thought he could be. So as the Japanese planes were flying by, he would poke out and shoot at them. And he said that um, one, he thinks he might have hit, he doesn't know. Yeah. He said he shot and it did crash, but he, he doesn't know. He said there was so much chaos that um, Hickam is just south of Pearl on the Oceanside, and he said that he saw two of our planes have a head-on collision and crash. He, he said he just watched, what can you do with a, with a little rifle? So he sat there in the safest place he could think of, and he always said his main goal was to not die. <laughs> I've asked him many times, like, well, what else did you do? He says, my goal was to survive. Right. So he, he looked out over towards Fort Island, and he said he saw the bomb hit the Arizona. He saw, you know, the, the whole thing happen, and the story kind of fades away after that. I, I've asked him numerous times, well, what did you do after that? He, he either doesn't remember, he either doesn't know, or he just um, won't talk about it, but the Worst thing that he and my mother would ever relate was in the several days after the attack, um, especially my mom, she, she would talk about how horrible it was, the tapping, the, the sailors would be trapped in the hulls of those ships and they'd be tapping out Morse code, trying to tell where they were, how many were there, were the injuries, what, you know, just the whole nine yards. And every day the tapping was less and less until one day there was no tapping. And I can remember my mom, really emotional. Yeah. That was one thing that she uh, had a hard time talking about. I, I think we all would have that problem. My mom wasn't there f during the bombing but she was there pretty quickly afterwards. She was one of the first women in the Navy in the waves after the war started. Mm -hmm. And she had a top secret clearance for ship's provisions. So she knew who was on the ship, where the ship was going. She knew everything about all the secret details about um, what was happening. And on her free time, she would volunteer at the Naval Hospital and read to, write letters for, do anything to help the sailors who were trying to survive, you know, that were in the hospital. So she, she was really active at interacting with the wounded sailors. And um, 
We had an interview just the other day with my dad. Why don't we show Would that? Would you like to look at that clip Why now? don't we show that and you, you From, all can... Uh, we, visited, uh, we visited her dad the other day. There it is. He's 95. He's <laughs> for, for some of the issues he has going on, he's doing quite well. Um, yeah. What was your favorite part of being in the Navy? What was the best part for you? Best what? What was the best part of being in the Navy? How did it help your life, or how did it make things better for you, or what part did you enjoy the most? Just trying to survive, for one thing. <laughs> Taught me quite a bit. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> I remember you used to say, that when you were in uh, the Air Corps, you always came back to a stake and a bed. And a lot of the guys got slop and cots or the ground and the, didn't come back. the fly boys always got a stake and, and a bed. So I remember he used to always be happy about that. And your squadron, yeah. Right. <laughs> that, that's pretty good. After. The whole reason my dad was at Pearl Harbor to begin with, um, I said he was on the Litchfield. He wanted to get a transfer to the Air Corps. So the Litchfield had dropped him off. They were back. So he was sitting there for a couple of days waiting for the troop transport to come and take him to Moffett for his air training. Mm -hmm. So he just happened to, I guess you could say, sort of accidentally be at the wrong place at the wrong okay. time. Um, took six months, he said. There was so much... Uh, trash or damaged ships in the channel, it took six months to get all that cleaned out where they could get the troop transport and things that were unnecessary things done. I mean, getting a troop transport in was not a critical, necessary thing, so getting him transferred was the least of their priorities. Mm -hmm. So um, he just sort of did whatever, hung out and did whatever while he was in limbo going to uh, the Naval Air Corps. But he eventually made it to Moffett for his air training. Now you told me before uh, during the break that um, your dad didn't often like to talk about this and when he would be engaged in a conversation, he would often stop in the middle of the conversation and that would be the end of it. But you also mentioned uh, the watchmaker story. Would you care to relate oh, that story? My one one day, my father and I took a uh, clock repair class together, and we were just discussing watches. And just out of the blue, he said, "You know, I had a really good friend that uh, was a really good watchmaker. Ex he did excellent jewelry work, and kind of talked a little bit about that. And all of a sudden, when he realized that he was remembering." He said, you know, and he was on the Arizona. Mm. And he would always, when he would realize that some thing was leading him into a story that had something to do with Pearl Harbor, connection to Pearl Harbor. it always would end the same way. Oh, and that was at Pearl Harbor. And boom. So the story that I'm trying to write and get documented, I'm trying to relate how it was like pulling teeth to get some of these details because every detail was like t pulling a tooth. When He just would never elaborate. When he realized he was thinking about it, he would shut down. Okay. A lot of the things were related by my mom because like I said, my, my mother didn't know him they were both stationed at Pearl Harbor, but they didn't know each other till after they got out of the service. Oh. So a lot of things, apparently he would have told my mother early on and he just wouldn't talk about it. So my mom would tell me, or he might tell me in a way that, like I said, if he suddenly remembered he was remembering, then he would shut down. So getting the whole story has taken many, many, many years. And we were talking about Pearl Harbor, and I remember how she was going on and on gushing about the heroes of Pearl Harbor and explaining everything. And just like every day, my mother would say, what did you learn in school today? 
Well, today we learned about Pearl Harbor and all the heroes and uh, how every you know how the Japanese came and bombed Pearl Harbor and the whole nine yards and I'm just going on and on about what we had learned and my mother says, "Would you like to meet one of those heroes?" I'm like. My gosh, yes, you know a hero? You know somebody from Pearl Harbor? You know, I didn't even know my mom was in the Navy at this point. And she goes, yeah, I, I know one, but I'll, I'll introduce you to one. Okay, so, you know, go do your chores, go do your homework, go do everything you need to do, and later on, I'll introduce you to one. Okay, so I can remember the door, I can remember her and my dad drive up, and the door opening, and him walking in. This is emotional part. And I'm just standing there, just, you know, here's my dad coming home like he comes home every day, and my mom is standing behind me and says, there's one of your heroes. And I was like, oh. I was just dumbfounded that you, I was said, you were one of the heroes? And of course, very emphatically, very determined, no, I am not a hero. I am not one of the heroes. The heroes never made it home. Yeah. He was very adamant that he was not one of those people. And he never said anything more, but that day was pretty profound for me that, yeah. um, that my mother knew about it and my mother knew one and that my dad was one. And my mother had this ability to seize the most amazing moment to tell you something important or introduce you to something important and um, extremely patriotic lady. Like most fathers, my father being the same way, he was also a Pearl Harbor survivor, he never really talked about any of it. Most of what I learned about his experience came from uh, hearsay stories from other members of the family or from finding letters uh, or other memorabilia that he had saved that was not offered to me, I would have to basically open the box down in the basement and go through it myself mm -hmm. in secret. But um, it was much the same way for most of the World War II veterans, frankly. They, uh, they did a war that they had to, they fought a war that they had to to preserve liberties for all of us, and they came home and tried to, to get right back into the, the swing of things. Family life is important, though, and uh, you kept in touch with the rest of the local Pearl Harbor survivors on behalf of your dad. And uh, ha before we got together, you provided me with some photos and uh, other memorabilia uh, that we could uh, show right now. And uh, perhaps as we're looking at it, you can uh, talk about it as mm -hmm. we move along. Sounds good. Okay. So, per, so perhaps now we'll look at the, uh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> That's my dad's baby picture. Uh-huh. <laughs> my, he uh, was a good looking, good oh, looking yeah, baby too. Oh yeah, baby, toe head, bright blue eyes. The tall, handsome one on the left is my dad. I don't know who the other guy is, but. Uh, and he's another Navy, mm -hmm. another swabby. There's your dad again. That's my dad on Waikiki Beach, probably on R&R. &R. Mm -hmm. That looks like the raw Hawaiian in the background. Yeah. And he was put up in a room in the front. That's, that's his um, graduation from boot camp picture. Really? 19, well, he had stripes already. 1938. That must have been a later picture. There's the uh, quilt label. I, maybe you can explain what that is. Uh, quilts of Honor is something that uh, another veteran, Gail Belmont, has put together. She, she and her group make quilts for um, veterans who've been injured or have gone through traumatic experiences. This is my dad getting initiated at the Pearl Harbor Survivors. That was Chuck Lishman. This was at the picnic, the last picnic that they had with six of them. Three of them have passed away already. Yeah, these are articles from the local articles paper about from the paper. Uh, about that very fact, and some of the people that were in those pictures are no longer with it. This is a month. letter from Harry Truman to my mother, thanking her for her service during the war, her volunteer service. Excellent. 
this is also from the picnic. Chuck, or Don Merritt is on the left. He's passed away. Chuck Lishman. Bob McNutt, he's passed away. This one here on the front is um, Russ Day. That's my dad with four of the uh, honor guard. Mm -hmm. Just They wanted their pictures taken with my dad, which I thought that was a really cute picture. Just another ceremony from, that was probably three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, and that's pretty much it, but uh, I thank you for providing that visual information. Uh, can I tell a funny story? No, please tell a funny story because we like to uh, add some levity. My, time to my time. dad liked being on ships, but he really wanted to be in the Air Corps. So after he got into the Air Corps, um, he was part of the crew of a B-29 bomber. Uh -huh. And one of his favorite stories to tell of something good was uh, they were just out playing one day. They were at Moffett. I guess they were still on air training. And um, they decide they're going to fly underneath the Golden Gate Bridge in this bomber. So here they go, flying underneath the bridge. And I can only imagine. He, I asked him one time <laughs> about it. And he goes, well, you know, it was kind of tight. There wasn't much room there. No, there isn't. <laughs> we, 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 did, we made it underneath there. And uh, I'm like, I thought that was illegal. He goes, oh, yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, we weren't supposed to do that. <laughs> so I guess they all got in trouble. And I, the, the punchline that my dad always thought was so funny was, you know, they would, I guess they said that he was going to get in trouble. And he, he thought it was so funny when he said, so what are you going to do to me, send me to Pearl Harbor? Because, yeah. <laughs> you know, what, what can you do to me that's already worse than I, I've already been through? But he loved the Air Corps. Um, he loved the Navy. My mother loved the Navy, so I grew up with Navy rules and singing anchors away before I ever learned any <laughs> nursery rhymes. And I'm just lucky to still have my dad around. Yes, and you are. Try to learn from him his secret of life. And I know some of the other Pearl Harbor survivors, and I'm really honored to be able to get to know them. And yeah. All the veterans. We honor all the veterans. But Pearl Harbor Day is a special, is a special as day. As a special and, day. And, that's and your father was yeah. one of one of the special guys too. Yes, he was. And to now look at my dad's uh, Pearl Harbor experience. And when we come back, we'll watch a little clip on the conspiracy theory. Uh, about Pearl Harbor uh, as food for thought for all of our viewers. My father, Albert Minelski, was born April 27, 1920, in the family home at 242 Woodbury Road in Hicksville, Long Island, New York. He was the second son of Andrew and Mary Minelski, his older brother Andrew having preceded him into the world. The family grew to include two more brothers and two sisters. Hicksville was largely a farming community in the 20s and 30s, and the house on Woodbury Road served then as the hub of the family's farming operation during that time. Albert Minelski was my grandfather. I knew him as Al, or Grandpa, but I remember my dad telling the story of Grandpa sighting Charles Lindbergh right after he took off from Roosevelt Field in Garden City, New York. On that historic day, it was May 21st, 1927, Grandpa would have been seven years old. The plane was flying slowly as it fought to gain altitude on a path that took it over the family farm. 33 and a half hours later, Lucky Lindy completed the first solo transatlantic flight, winning a $25,000 prize and heralding the advent of global aviation. Grandpa was a first-hand witness to an amazing historic event. And that wasn't the last part of history that Dad was to witness firsthand. Two years later, 
came the great stock market crash of 1929, fueled by easy money, greed, and leverage. My grandfather, Andrew Minowski, perhaps foresaw the coming crash due to the wild speculation and rising land prices. It's been said that he sold the farmland and leased it back early in 1929, just before the crash. He survived the Depression when others were not so fortunate. But the Depression lingered on through the 30s. At 18, Dad graduated from Hicksville High School in June of 1938. Dad already had plans for his life. He was featured in the senior class play, Don't Ever Grow Up. And he was about ready to do just that in very short order. One month after his graduation, he received written permission from his father to enlist in the Navy. He began his four-year enlistment in 1939. After basic training, he was assigned to the newly commissioned light cruiser USS Helena. Helena launched on 27 August 1939, was commissioned in September of that year, and departed on 14 October from New York on its shakedown cruise. It departed at Annapolis in late December of that year, crossing the equator on January 13, 1940. Helena and its crew visited Buenos Aires, Argentina, and Montevideo, Uruguay during that shakedown cruise. The war in Europe was already in full swing. The British had been engaged in a raising sea battle with Nazi Germany. German submarines had been devastating British merchant shipping. The Germans carried the encounter into the Southern Hemisphere, hoping to ally with or gain sympathy from neutral nations. The German pocket battleship Graf Spee had been at sea at the start of Second World War and had sunk several merchantmen in the Indian Ocean and the South Atlantic. One of the hunting groups sent to search for her consisted of three Royal Navy cruisers, HMS Exeter, Ajax, and Achilles. All three found and engaged Graf Spee in the River Platte estuary, close to the coast of Argentina and Uruguay in South America. All of the ships suffered battle damage and casualties, and Spee's commanding officer opted to enter Montevideo Harbor for repairs, expected to take over two weeks. Under the Hague Convention at that time, Neutrality restrictions limited the ship to a 72-hour stay. Otherwise, she would be interned there for the rest of the war. The German commander opted to scuttle the ship in shallow waters outside the harbor rather than risk trying to return to friendly waters in a badly damaged ship and risk the lives of his remaining crew. This action reportedly outraged Adolf Hitler. Langdorf, the ship's commandant, committed suicide a few days later. Epilogue. Helena visits Montevideo from 19 January to 3 February 1940. Members of Helena's crew board and inspect the vessel. Dad's letter home to his mom at this time mentions the friendliness of the people in Montevideo and his discovery of the Spanish word for ice cream, helados. No mention of the spay was made, however. Helena returned to New York in early March of 1940 after making stops in Brazil, Guantanamo Bay, and Norfolk, Virginia. And Nor Helena was assigned to the Pacific Fleet. A plan of the day for January 13, 1941 shows a busy schedule from sunup to sundown, with drills, exercises, and rigorous battle preparation exercises. Japanese plans for an eventual naval action against the U.S. and the Pacific were no secret. The Japanese had been steadily building their navy through the 1930s 
for just such an event. Americans had embraced an isolationist policy for years. By entering into the tripartite pact with Germany and Italy in September of 1940, Japan effectively acknowledged the Nazi and fascist causes in Europe and in turn was recognized by them in their efforts to dominate Greater East Asia. In an effort to force the Japanese to withdraw from Manchuria, stringent economic sanctions had been placed upon Japan by the U.S., limiting that country's access to scrap metal steel and bunker fuel. Some analysts reason that the Japanese were given no choice but to retaliate. Official Japanese accounts indicated that plans for the sneak attack were being made as early as February of 41. Certainly, the large and expanding naval presence of the U.S. in Hawaii made it clear that some aggression should be expected. As early as one week before the attack occurred, a local newspaper predicted such an event as imminent. On Sunday, December 7, 1941, Japan launched a sneak attack on the U.S. Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor. Eighteen naval vessels, including eight battleships, were sunk or heavily damaged. 188 planes were destroyed and over 2,000 servicemen were killed. Dad's ship, the Helena, reported 34 crewmen killed and 69 wounded. Only three minutes into the attack, a Japanese torpedo bomber launched a torpedo that hit Helena on the starboard side. Some 21 men were killed immediately. Others died or were seriously wounded from the flash fire resulting from the explosion. Dad was among the more fortunate of the crew members. He had been relieved of his watch on the ship that Sunday morning to attend Catholic Mass on Ford Island. He was still on Ford Island when the attack occurred. In a letter he sent home to his mom five days later from Pearl Harbor, he acknowledged that some of his shipmates had not been so fortunate. Helena suffered extensive damage in the attack, and it was determined that repairs would have to be made stateside. The ship was brought to Mare Island Naval Shipyard for repairs, which were not completed until late June in 1942. In the meantime, Dad had applied for and been accepted to Submariner's School in New London, Connecticut. By November of 1942, he was a crew member of the USS Flying Fish, SS-229, a Gato-class submarine commissioned just three days after the Pearl Harbor attack. On January 12th of 1943, he was awarded a commendation for his contributions during the ship's third war patrol, in which he attacked and sank two Japanese destroyers. Dad also served as a crew member of the USS Sunfish, SS-281, also a Gato-class submarine. When he completed his naval career, he was a chief petty officer. Sunfish had been commissioned in July of 1942, and both subs operated from Pearl Harbor. News clippings from Dad's records recall the tragic fate of his original ship, the Helena. After being repaired from the damage sustained at Pearl Harbor, she sailed again to action at Guadalcanal, Savo Island, and Cape Esperance, earning seven battle stars and a Navy unit commendation letter. Her unfortunate end came about on 6 July 1943 when she was sunk at the Battle of Kula Gulf and 165 of her crew perished. I'm not sure when my dad served his last patrol on Sunfish and when he returned stateside, 
but I do know he was married to my mom, Marie Dolores Dawson, on May 19, 1945, that the war ended in the Pacific later that year when the atomic bombs were dropped and Japan sued for peace. Dad was honorably discharged from the Navy, and he and Mom started a family in California. I was born there in 1946, my sister in 1947, but we were not destined to be raised there. My dad was a strong-willed man, and he had other ideas. By 1947, Dad had decided to leave California for good and moved back to his hometown of Hicksville, New York. He built a house trailer in the backyard of my maternal grandmother's house in Santa Monica, California. The family of four, Dad, Mom, myself, and my sister, arrived there in mid-1948. Dad was industrious and hardworking and knew that veterans like himself would be contributing factors to the post-war economic expansion. He worked hard and by the early 1950s was able to start the business that sustained him and his growing family for the rest of his life, Chroma Paint. The business outgrew its original location and soon moved into a shopping center to gain more exposure. But after a few years of paying rent and watching his rental rates rise along with his business income, he wanted to become an owner, not a tenant. He purchased an old bakery location at a strategic corner on Broadway in Hicksville, rehabbed and expanded on the property. Then he relocated the store there in the early 60s. I worked there through high school and while I was going to JC shortly thereafter. Part of the original property was destroyed by fire when I was in Vietnam. At any rate, the current building on the site, which was built in 1967, stands there today and still operates as Chroma Paint. Dad's life and his legacy are a shining example of what author Tom Brokaw has termed the greatest generation. As the oldest of his eight children, he held me to a very high standard. Now I can see why. Present and future generations may never fully grasp the enormous transition that occurred during his generation and the personal and collective sacrifices those of his generation were willing to make. Japan was up to. We knew it before Pearl Harbor. We knew it all through the war. From the outset, some experts asserted that the highest echelons of the administration of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt knew of the Japanese plans in advance and did nothing to stop them. As new evidence emerges, the charges persist, giving rise to fierce debate. FDR, it seems, obviously wanted the Japanese to surprise and utterly destroy Pearl Harbor. What motive could Roosevelt possibly have had for doing such a thing? There's not a drop of evidence. There's speculation, accusation, allegation, and I think sort of dreaming. What we have here is a cover-up and a conspiracy on the part of the FDR administration. Did President Roosevelt know in advance and has a government-led cover-up continued to this day? To do the same. Oh, well, thank you for having me. I, I think it's a huge honor to try to teach other people, the new generation, what some of our family has gone through to protect our country or look after it. And I do know a couple other Pearl Harbor survivors that I might get you an in with. Good. <laughs> that would be great. Excellent. Well, thank you again. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for uh, watching tonight's program, and we urge you to come back again and watch our next production of Valley Veterans Forum.
Why do we have a Pearl Harbor Remembrance Day at all? After all, it was 73 years ago, at almost this exact minute, it was 7.55 over Oahu when the first wave of Japanese came and attacked. Now what military historians will tell you is that although the Japanese won that battle, they lost the war. They made critical mistakes, but their most critical mistake was they attacked America. They attacked America. They, they woke the sleeping giant. Civilization, as we knew it, was at stake. Tyranny was going to overrun the globe unless or until the Americans entered World War II. And they entered it because of the egregious attack on Pearl Harbor. And that's December 7th, 1941, a day that will live in infamy. What's that mean? I looked up the word infamy in Webster's. It is a noun meaning evil fame or reputation, public disgrace, dishonor or reproach, an infamous act, scandalous to the last degree. I think FDR chose the proper word to describe Pearl Harbor attack. Yes, the surprise attack on the U.S. fleet in Pearl Harbor by the Empire of Japan on Sunday morning at 7.55 a.m. Hawaii time was truly infamous. And as that Yamamoto put it, awoke the sleeping giant. The attack was over by 11 a.m. Hawaii time and 1 p.m. Washington, <laughs> D.C. time. Then the Japanese declared war on the United States. The next day, Germany and Italy declared war on the United States because they were allied to Japan. 2,403 Americans killed, 1,178 wounded, 15 ships and 198 aircraft destroyed during attack. Any Pearl Harbor survivors in the audience? I know there are a few. Raise your hand today. We must ensure that future Americans never forget the day of infamy or the consequence of losing our freedoms. And I think we must always remember Pearl Harbor. So, enjoy the holidays. God bless you and God bless America.